Thank you. Uh, this is the Friday, May 6th meeting of the elementary school building committee. And the first thing I need to do is call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum and a recording has been started. We're gonna be sure we double check each time. <laughs> we, do, we do our sound check, so we are being recorded. And so I'm just gonna call out the names of the committee members. Um, one person, Phoebe, has emailed me that she won't be here this morning, but we'll record as people join. If they're not in this first call, it will record whether they were present or absent. Um, and I'm calling out to make sure you can hear and be heard. Paul? Present. Mike? Present. Jonathan? Morning. Sean? Present. Rupert? Yes, I'm here. Tammy? Present. Morning. Ben? Present. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to turn the meeting over at this point to Margaret, who will uh, quickly show us the agenda for the day. It is a packed agenda. And then um, uh, she will be leading into Donna, because we have guests with us this morning, consultants who have done the traffic study. So Donna will be introducing the other people you see on the screen. Margaret, it's all yours. Okay, everybody, hopefully you can see this. So just quickly, um, I'm gonna make a couple of introductory comments um, about various things that are going on. We're, the main point of discussion, as Kathy just noted, is the traffic study. Um, Donna and her team are gonna talk some more about teacher feedback that we've received this week. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the cost estimating process and timeline. Um, Kathy is hoping, because we've bumped it a couple times, to come back to the criteria matrix, and I'll bring that up for discussion. We have one invoice to review, which I uh, emailed you last night, which is Danisco's invoice, which was just received yesterday, but I thought we should take it up. Um, and then just to recap, going forward, we have um, scheduled right now a meeting for a week from today that is not a presentation, just a discussion. Um, shortly after that, the cost estimating documents are going to the cost estimators, and we'll talk in more detail about that process today. Then on the 20th, we're going to have a regular meeting um, with public comment that is going to be focused on uh, looking at the estimating materials and providing any comments that need to get folded in to the estimate. Then we have um, a June 3rd regular meeting, which is going to be now moving towards a decision. There's a final community forum on June 9th for this, uh, for the per preferred schematic report period. And then uh, June 17th meeting was scheduled. We need to reschedule that because it is the last day of school for some of our committee members who will be very tied up. And then a regular meeting on the 24th, which is the vote to submit this document to the MSBA. So that is that. Um, let me just make a couple of comments. Um, hang on a second, let me get my notes up here. Margaret, I just wanna acknowledge that Angelica has joined us and Angelica, just if you could let us know whether you can sit here and be heard. Yes, I can hear, thank you. Good morning. And Good Allison morning, everybody. has joined us and Allison is with us also. Hi, Allison. Right, so by, by way of introduction, um, Donna and her team will talk more about this, but um, you know, the Obviously the cost of these projects, these options is a kind of a big deal. Um, the, on our meeting on the 20th, you know, we'll have a chance to delve into them. It's quite a bit of material to look at, but I wanna reassure everyone that um, it's, it's about a two week estimating process. And at the end of it, there's a reconciliation. There are two estimates going on in parallel. So there will be an opportunity. I don't want anyone to think, um, that because they haven't looked at the materials before they've gone to the estimator, that the, any comments or questions that come up from the committee will not be able to be acknowledged and if appropriate, folded in. So that's one thing to, to note. 
Um, a second thing I wanted to mention is that we, Kathy and I have been working on how best to um, accommodate um, comments that are being made, uh, written comments we're receiving. And I don't know if you had a chance to look, but what we've decided to do is, uh, let me figure out how to pull this up. We're gonna actually put um, responses to, we're collecting the comments at the end of the meeting minutes, and we're putting responses in red. We're taking those questions and answers off and folding them into a separate document that will be in the meeting packet each month. So I'm not gonna pull that up because I wanna make sure we can get onto the other things. When we get to the matrix, I just wanna note that um, Denisco uh, has been able to update the buildable usable area, which was a question that came up in an earlier meeting. And then also, uh, just cause there isn't enough going on <laughs> at one time, we did receive the MSBA comments just before the last meeting and uh, Denisco has worked mightily to respond to a lot of very detailed comments. And those were shared with you, I think yesterday and are posted in the packet. I don't believe there's anything that you need to respond to, but perhaps just to be aware, as I noted in my cover note, you know, that they're fairly typical, the level of detail, um, that there um, won't be any further back and forth until we get receive comments on the next set of documents. So I think that was all I wanted to say before I turn it over to Donna and her team to talk about traffic. And awesome. Margaret, just for your record, I also want to make sure Alicia Walker has joined us. Alicia, can you hear us? Yeah. And if you could just acknowledge and say you're here. Uh, Alicia, you're on mute. I think she'll, we'll, we'll check with her later, but she's, she is logged on, Margaret. Okay, I got it. Okay, Donna. Awesome, good morning. Uh, with us this morning, uh, we have two uh, guests. We have Tim Thompson from PAR Engineering and David Loring from PAR Engineering, and they're our traffic consultants. So uh, they, they were also present last night. So for those that maybe watched the uh, presentation last night, you, you're going to hear the same, but hopefully this will also allow us an opportunity for a little more dialogue. So I'm going to uh, just get right into it based on the agenda that was um, issued. I have a little screen today. So talk, just from, from our perspective, talking about the traffic study, the conversation about a two versus three story building, and then the cost estimating process, which I think Margaret pretty much covered, but we maybe have a little more conversation about that. So I am just going to turn this over to Tim. Thanks, Donna. And, uh, yeah, and so I guess I just would like to say, um, maybe maybe it makes sense, Tim, um, after each site that we pause and, and let folks ask the questions as it pertains to each site that might make the most sense today. Sure, makes sense. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Tim Thompson uh, with Park Corporation. Um, I'll just, we have completed our traffic study uh, for the two sites. Um, so this morning, I'd just like to give a, an overview of the results of our, our study and uh, some potential mitigation options uh, we're looking into at, um, at each site. So just to start off, um, a quick review of the existing conditions at each site. Um, for the Fort River site that you see here, um, this site operates with um, two loops uh, for pickup and drop off. Uh, the bus loop that's shown in yellow on the right side operates independently from the, the parent loops, which are denoted in blue. Um, the parent loops also have two locations where students are picked up and dropped off, so it's, it's separated um, with younger students being um, loaded and unloaded separately. So this system works, um, works fairly well. It works pretty efficiently. Um, a lot of that is due to the fact that the, the buses and parents are separated and there are those two parent loading locations, um, but also due to the, uh, the staff, um, the heavy staff presence on site. Um, and that's not something that's um, 
unique to, to Fort River or, or elementary schools in general. We, we usually see, especially with younger students, um, that there is a large staff presence on site to help with uh, those drop off and pick up operations. At, uh, at Wildwood, um, it's actually a fairly similar operation uh, with the bus loop being separate from the parent loop. And again, there's uh, two locations for parents to, to load and unload again, separated by, by grades. Um, again, this, this site works fairly well and efficiently um, and safely. I know that there's actually at both sites, there's been some modifications um, to the site operations um, with COVID and the increase in, in parent drop-off traffic that, um, that the schools have seen. Uh, but again, here, there's a heavy staff presence that helps with that, that loading and unloading operation. So for our traffic study, uh, we, we project our conditions out into the future and we actually, we, we look at seven years. It's a um, mass DOT standard to, to look out that far. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that, you know, looking out into the future, uh, we, we do acknowledge that there are other potential developments going on in town. Um, and when we look in our study area and we project traffic conditions out in the future, we, we do account for background growth uh, beyond that, just associated with, with the school work. So you can see on the right, um, all of the study intersections that were included in our traffic study. So, um, you know, the, the total study area, uh, you know, encompasses both the Fort River and the Wildwood site. Um, it's a rather large study area, uh, given the, the extent of, of this, uh, this work here. Um, and basically we're looking at, you know, two scenarios, one with uh, the student population increasing at the Wildwood site, and then a second scenario where it's increasing at the Fort River site. So what we used um, to help us determine how traffic would be rerouted through the study area was the, uh, the school district maps for each of these elementary schools. And then also um, we, we took a look at housing distribution throughout those district areas and assigned routes to and from each school um, based on that assessment. So when we complete a traffic study, the, the most critical piece of it is what we call a capacity analysis. And that's where we're looking at each intersection within our study area individually. And we are assessing the uh, specific impacts associated with additional traffic at those intersections and how that compares to a situation where, again, we're looking in the future with some of this background growth, um, but we're specifically adding the traffic associated with the, with the school project. So uh, when we perform a capacity analysis, we, we look at what we call a level of service. And uh, a level of service is, uh, it's a rating system um, that we assign to uh, each intersection. And uh, you can see it's a rating system that goes from A through F and it uh, is determined by the amount of delay that each vehicle experiences going through the intersection. So it's, it's an average amount of delay in seconds uh, per vehicle. So you can see that there's a, in this table, there's a, a, a difference between an intersection that's signalized versus unsignalized. So um, again, that's broken up as you can see here by the amount of uh, delay that a vehicle experiences traveling through the intersection. So, I know that there's a lot of information shown in this table here, so I'll try to um, give you just the highlights from these next few tables. Um, and what we really wanted to show by showing this whole table is really the, the level of detail that we get into with the traffic study. So you can see that um, along the left, we actually look at each intersection, but not only the intersection as a whole, but by each movement uh, for each approach to the intersection. So the first uh, few tables here are going to highlight some of the intersections that experience the um, the greatest impact from the the project, and as would be expected, they're the intersections that are are closest to each of the sites. So the first few that I'll I'll talk about are a couple intersections that are close to the the Fort River site. So the first intersection here is Main Street um, with Northeast Street and Southeast Street. 
Um, the this is specifically looking at the morning peak hour. So they're in the school arrival period, and you know, typically when we look at schools, we look at the the morning arrival period and then the afternoon dismissal period. And the morning arrival period is generally the the worst of the two conditions, uh, given that that peak period tends to overlap with uh, general commuting traffic too, which which we see is you know high during the morning as as folks are heading to work. Um, so what I just want to highlight here, if you look over to the top right, you'll see um, for the condition of uh, with the build at Fort Rivers, you can see a couple of uh, level of service Fs with high delay associated, particularly with the, the northbound approach to that signalized intersection. Next slide. This table here, we're looking at the, um, the afternoon dismissal peak period. Um, and if you look at that same location in the in the table, um, you can see we're we're looking at C's and D's as opposed to F's. Um, so as I mentioned, traffic conditions generally during the the dismissal period are uh, a little lighter since it's not overlapping with a typical commuter peak. Uh, another intersection that's that's close to that Fort River site that we looked at was the the Southeast Street and College Street intersection. Um, you can you can see here during the morning peak, uh, we do experience a number of uh, E's and D's along the, the right side under the build condition. But really, if you compare that to the future no build condition, which again does not include the school traffic, um, this is really what, what we're looking at when we're making comparisons to determine uh, traffic impacts, that no build scenario versus the build scenario. And you can see that there's really only a slight increase in delay um, pretty much across the board with a, with a few seconds. So um, less of an impact at this signalized intersection than the one to the north. Conditions at that same signal with college at College Street uh, during the school dismissal period um, very similar results. We're, we're seeing C's and D's, but again, just a moderate increase in um, in delay per um, for each movement here. So, again, a, a smaller impact than compared to the intersection to the north. Uh, then, looking at the uh, the driveways to the school itself, uh, under the condition where there's the the build at, at Fort River. Um, you can see in the, the bottom right of the table, we're seeing uh, level of service Fs for the, um, at the school driveway. Um, you know, this is the condition that we looked at for the Fort River build um, was actually allowing movements out of the southern driveway. So existing circulation pattern at Fort River allows uh, only entry movements at the southern driveway and exit movements for both lefts and rights at the northern driveway. And as a way to help us reduce the impact that that signalized intersection just to the north of the site has on the driveway, where that northbound queue um, spills back past the intersection and can cause some, uh, some, some conflicts, we wanted to eliminate the safety concern associated with left turn movements out of that by moving those left turns to the, the, uh, the southern site driveway. So again, you can see that during this morning peak hour, again, when traffic conditions are higher, we, we are seeing a level of service F at the, at the site driveway. Same intersection for the school dismissal period. You can see that that is at an, an E. Um, again, this is really associated more with the um, the general amount of traffic that's on uh, East Street, um, just given that it's a uh, doesn't coincide with a typical commuter peak. Uh, looking at the um, the other um, Fort River driveway, uh, you can see what, this is the driveway where we're, we were allowing uh, only right turns from the site. Uh, much better uh, level of service, lower delay under both the morning and the, the school peak hours. So 
given some of the, the locations that we've seen where the addition of school traffic, um, we're, we're expecting to have an impact on uh, adjacent intersections and the school driveways themselves. We've we've looked at a couple of uh, mitigation alternatives uh, to help improve traffic conditions uh, at at these spots where we we see congestion. So, this diagram here on the right shows potential improvements at the Main Street uh, Southeast Street signalized intersection. So, what we're showing here is some intersection uh, widening to um, allow some more stacking space at the intersections. Given that we're, we would be anticipating more, more traffic um, at this intersection, the widening of the intersection and the extension of the turn lanes would provide additional uh, room for vehicles to, to wait at the signal. Uh, we'd also be looking at replacing that <clears throat> traffic signal equipment. Um, one, it's, it's, it's um, slightly older traffic signal equipment and two, there are some signal timing and phasing uh, improvements that we'd wanna make associated with this intersection as well. Um, so right now that's, that's one, um, one option at this intersection that we're looking at for improvements. So you can see here uh, in the table, the two columns to the right show conditions with the potential uh, intersection improvements at Main Street and, uh, and East. And you can see that those, those Fs that are shown for the northbound approach um, improve to, to E's and D's um, with, the, with the intersection improvements. So maybe we stop here, Kathy, if that works and see if anyone has any questions for um, the Port River site. Jonathan. Good, good morning. Um, so my question, it has mostly to do with what, so this is a well-known knot of traffic <laughs> in town, you know, especially yeah. for any of the parents like myself who, who have kids at, at Fort River, none of this is really surprising. And it wouldn't surprise me that, that you know, it gets worse with more students or, or that there are ways to improve it. Um, sure. My question is as much for the for maybe for Paul or others in the town about whether other improvements have been studied to this in the past. Are there other things that are happening in parallel with this? Um, and then somewhat related to that, the second question, how much of this becomes project cost versus other town costs when once we start getting past the street or past the property line, I should say. Thank you. Paul. Um do you want to respond to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think any kind of improvements we would want to factor in and where, where the funds come from is a, is, a different, is a different question. I think I might, I was, had a distraction, so I didn't hear the beginning of your question, Jonathan, I'm sorry. I, I'm curious as to whether or not, you know, uh, has the DPW looked at, at these two intersections in the past? Are there other things that have been thought about that have, have you know, have it moved forward for whatever reason um, in the way of improvements in, in this area, because everyone in town kind of knows this is a, a thorny not first thing in the morning, particularly. Yeah, so the intersection with College Street is is, is just a mess, it's designed poorly. Um, we, we, we are making sidewalk improvements there, but nothing, we don't have funds to do a major improvement in the intersection. We have looked at a, a roundabout on the Main Street uh, intersection, um, and I think, you know, they, yeah, I wondered they, about that. Yeah, they, I think the engineers have met with the DPW, so they probably are aware of what, what they've considered. Okay. Thank you. Margaret? Yeah, so Jonathan, I'll answer the part of the question about um, funding. So the MSBA won't fund anything that's outside of the site, and they typically won't fund traffic improvements because they, they think, and it's hard to disagree with them, that it's a town piece, you know, with this project in general, and Donna's met, mentioned this before, I believe, there's um, the MSBA does not limit the amount of money you spend on a site, but they would cap the reimbursement for what is on the site at 8% of construction. But the things that um, we're going to be looking at today in terms of mitigation, I would say, it, once they're, they're outside of the site or totally outside of it. Now, that being said, these mitigation measures are gonna be estimated. 
so that they can be part of your consideration of the sort of potential overall project cost. Um, but I, my presumption is if they were undertaken, they would be undertaken by the town and probably outside of the project. Now, I, you know, I was just gonna add a little bit, as, as Paul said, this has come up before and it's come up particularly with the Belchertown um, development, the affordable that is now not just an idea, but it's moving forward. And everyone identified these intersections as needing uh, some work without any, what are we going to do about it yet? So it's been on the town's radar screen um, for both pedestrian, bike, and car, um, that if we're bringing in more people in housing in this area, uh, trying to think about how people, bike, and car flows work uh, outside. So I had a question on the on-site um, with the 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 it looks like one issue is there's an issue of getting into the school in the morning and then leaving the school there's a that delay does the amount of space that the Fort River site has is it enough to allow the queue that is happening with that uh, it looked like it's as much as a three minute or more wait to get to leave um, T T Tim, I, you know, I was just, you know, I was just trying to get a sense of um, what happens to people when they can't leave right away. Um. Yeah, so we're actually, we, we don't have a um, mitigation um, concept shown at the at the site driveways, but it is something that we're looking into to help alleviate that. You know, I know in the tables we were showing um, some level of service Fs for the exiting movements from the uh, from the site, and and that's something that we're continue to continuing to to assess. So we're we're trying to you know improve improve a condition there where we where we aren't seeing backups into the school. Yeah. So so Kathy, just to add to that. We're looking at, as Tim was saying, making sure that we maintain separation of cars and buses for any option, that we increase the queuing on site to alleviate you know, its spilling on to the street. So as, and again, you know, the parking lots that we've identified and, and the um, I guess the circulation on the site will continue to be refined as we as we move forward with a preferred solution. But I also just want to mention to everyone that we had a great conversation with uh, Guilford and Jason earlier this week, and they too, you know, we went through. They agree with the all of, all of the data that's been presented. Everyone understands it's a challenge in town. We talked about uh, other other possibilities for mitigation at the intersection. We did study a uh, roundabout here, and there's just added challenges with that um, because of of the properties that are associated with it. But we're also we can continue to study that if that's the preferred uh, solution there. And. They, they too recognized the other thing is as far as growth out of all of the developments that are in the works, so to speak, there's only one development that has are, are is at the phase where they've actually brought forth kind of a traffic study. Tim, is that accurate? That is true. So a number of those studies that were listed up, up front in uh, my presentation were um, yeah, as Donna mentioned, they, they, they're early on in their design stages. Allison, I see Allison and Rupert Tander up. Yeah, Allison. Yeah, um, I apologize if this is a, uh, asking you to repeat something. Um, I'm trying to make sure I understand in terms of funding, since this has been an issue in the past and it sounds like improvements need to be made. Um, is this a part of the buildings problem? Like, is this something that our budgets have to cover? If it is a part of our budgets, is the NMSBA covering this kind of stuff? Are they contributing to it? I just want to understand how it fits in terms of categories, in terms of budgets. Um, 
Margaret, you need to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, so Allison, the, the MSBA would not reimburse on improvements that are outside of the project site. Um, and it is you know, a question for the town. Um, I guess the way I would think about this is that it, the town ca can decide to spend money on these things. We certainly want to, and we want to, and we will include the costs as part of the estimates, but they will be identified as being an additional cost that would need to be funded by the town outside of the, the base building cost. So the MSBA won't look at this or opine on this. It's completely the town's decision whether to go ahead with the mitigate these possible changes on either site and to fund them. Um, so I think what the, the way to think about this would be, it's an option and the important data to grasp is both what, what the functioning would be like if no intervention was done or with the intervention. And you have to so really kind of think about both because the intervention is a sort of a separate project, essentially. Does that make, does that answer your question? I think so. And, and in terms of the types of um, site work that need, or not site work, but the traffic work that needs to be done to either Fort River or Wildwood, it seems like the costs associated specifically with the school for Fort River need to be documented separate from the improvements that are what the town needs to do anyway, because I think that could make the Fort River site be inflated when there are problems with that area anyway. So I just want us right. to be clear about exactly. that. Exactly. So, so, I mean, the, t the town can choose to fold them into the, the contracting of the project, but you, know, you should think about it as the bank is not going to help with that cost or it can be treated as a separate project. And, and just for everyone's benefit, we are going to have separate um, line items in the cost estimates for the improvements offsite. So we'll include them as part of the cost estimate, but we're not gonna fold it into the overall project cost. We'll just have those as separate line items. Rupert. Thank you. Um, as I'm sure um, you guys are aware, uh, our uh, custodial staff also goes offsite to help direct traffic uh, and keep pedestrians safe uh, at both sites. I know at uh, Fort River, uh, once the pedestrians have successfully crossed, uh, they sometimes intercede with uh, traffic down at the exit to exit from Fort River to let the buses out. Um, and I'm curious whether uh, changes to the timing and phasing in the, in the signalizing would have any impact on that, or do you see us continuing to need to have uh, human intervention out there? Thank you. Well, the, the signal at, uh, at Main Street, it currently has a, what we call an exclusive pedestrian phase. So all traffic stops when the, the pedestrian signal is illuminated. Um, and yes, the, the custodial staff out there just ensures that you know, students are, are waiting properly um, and abiding by the, the rules of the signal um, to make those movements. So with the, the phasing improvements that you know, we would look at including as part of that signal reconstruction, uh, we'd, we'd likely have an exclusive pedestrian phase there as well, operating in a similar manner. Um, you know, there, there could be some geometric improvements at that intersection to help shorten crossing distance and generally make it safer for pedestrians. Um, but if the, you know, given what we've seen with the, how the custodial staff op operates out there, um, it may still be beneficial to have them out there just to ensure that students are um, abiding by the, you know, the rules of, of crossing the intersection. And Tim, if I could just add the existing equipment doesn't allow for it, right, it's it's old, so it doesn't you, you can't make certain adjustments based on the existing equipment. Well, one of the um, one of the things that we're looking at is um, allowing some protected left turn movements, um, particularly for the northbound left, and that would involve uh, equipment replacement to be able to add that movement in. Alicia. 
Um, so I'm just wondering, the northbound on southeast shows F for both Wildwood and Fort, the Fort River build. And so I'm wondering um, why the impact for Wildwood on slides 12 and 13 are listed as NA. Um, and I'm wondering if that implies that there might be mitigation needed for both the Wildwood and Fort River build. Donna, could you go back to that table? So is this the table? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. So yeah, you, you do see an increase in delay for that northbound left. And that's really a result of um, parent traffic that's currently going to Fort River. Um, there's a portion of that traffic that originates at the uh, the southeast portion of town. And currently that traffic would go to the school, drop off their, their child, and then um, likely distribute south of the school. So they wouldn't be actually traversing through the main street signal. And then under the condition where everybody's at, um, at Wildwood, that portion of traffic is gonna have to go through that signal to make it up to the Wildwood site. So there is a increase in traffic at that intersection under both scenarios. So I hope that clears that up. Yeah, it, <clears throat> sorry, thank you. I was thinking so, but I just wanted to clarify because the families that live southwest of Fort River will still need to travel the same route regardless of which site is chosen. Correct. Um, there'll, there'll still be a portion that has to traverse through intersections that it is today. Okay, thank you. So what we can, I guess, um, that I think that was the question. If you have students, you know, south of Fort River and the new school is at Wildwood, right? You're saying that they have to go through this intersection to get over to Wildwood. So regardless of the solution. Okay. So we, um, Kathy, I, I guess yep. we'll just keep going. I mean, we can bring that. Mm. Right, here we go. Is this the slide, Tim? I think so. Yeah. So sorry, I was muted yeah. there. Um, so again, at, at Wildwood, uh, we again see. The, the greatest amount of impacts um, associated with intersections that are, are closest to the school, as we would expect. Um, the, the results that we're showing here are East Pleasant Street and Strong Street. And again, we're looking at that morning peak hour and then the school dismissal hour. Um, at this intersection, you'll see here under the, the Wildwood build condition, which is the column second from the right, um, during the morning, that intersection, uh, the westbound movement, which is the, the stop controlled movement, um, moves from a, a C to a D. Um, and then in the afternoon, we see that that moves from a, a C to an F. So this, this one makes a little bit more sense compared to the, um, the Fort River site because we're having uh, more traffic exiting the site in the afternoon with a you know combination of, of parent traffic and then um, you know school staff that might be leaving uh, just after parent traffic as well. And then looking at the the Wildwood driveway on Strong Street um, during the the morning peak that northbound movement which is currently stop controlled um, would be level of service C, and then in the afternoon we would be looking at a level of service B. So a mitigation alternative that we've uh, been investigating at the, the Wildwood driveway site is uh, the conversion of that stop control that comes, um, that you reach as you're exiting the, 
uh, the site driveway, converting that intersection from that stop control to, uh, to a roundabout. And you can see a, a concept of what that roundabout might look like uh, on the right side there. Um, one of the advantages, well, a couple of the advantages of a roundabout at this location, uh, one is it would help traffic exiting the site. Um, they, the, as you'll see in the next slide, the, the level of service improves under this condition. Um, but roundabouts also have a benefit of reducing vehicle speeds. Um, and we know that speeds along Strong Street have been uh, brought up as a, uh, as a concern. And you know, really with the placement of this roundabout and the traffic calming effects associated with it um, right in front of the school, uh, you know, we see as a, as a safety improvement as well as a opportunity to alleviate uh, congestion exiting the site. And we, I should also note that we don't have, we aren't showing a diagram, but we're also looking at um, improvements at the, the Strong Street, uh, Pleasant Street intersection as well. So we're, we're considering possibly adding um, turn lanes at that intersection, or we're even looking into seeing if signalization of that intersection may be warranted. So we're, we recognize that that, you know, is, is a, uh, could be an issue with the, the build at Wildwood and, and we're trying to come up with uh, alternatives to address that. So I, I would also uh, just like to add that this roundabout, um, while it will improve, you know, kind of the speed and the safety, it won't change the level of service at the intersection or coming out of the driveway. Um, and, and then we did also, Tim, maybe you could talk a little bit about at one point Denisco was saying maybe we could get another secondary means of access or egress off the site. And when we started looking at Strong Street coming down the steep slope, maybe, maybe you want to talk to that? Yeah, so as Donna mentioned, there have been discussions about what a second uh, driveway to, the, to and from the site might look like and looking towards the east side of the, uh, of the site. There's of course, uh, grade challenges there that would have to be overcome. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a grade differential between where that parking lot lies now and then Strong Street itself. And then uh, there's also some curvature in Strong Street um, to the, the east and uh, both vertical curvature and horizontal placement of trees, that type of thing that, um, might limit the site distance available from that driveway. So it, it might, we might be limited with where exactly, how far east that driveway could go to, uh, to allow for proper sight lines exiting the site. But I think what we were hearing is that the issue, that, that probably wouldn't alleviate a, a lot of the congestion anyway. And um, part of it is because a lot of people actually go out to East Pleasant Street. So is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, if we were looking at a scenario that had the second driveway, we would probably look at um, having one of those driveways be entry only and the other be exit only. And just to simplify circulation on the site. So we would still have uh, the majority, if not all traffic exiting from, from one location. Um, so Donna's right, we would still experience, um, you know, a level of, of um, congestion uh, exiting the site. Um, Tim, didn't we also talk a little bit about the speeds reached by westbound traffic on Strong and maybe some other traffic coming east of the driveway might help? Um, it... it I mean, traffic calming along this stretch of Strong Street could certainly be, you know, considered. Um, whether that's uh, additional signing or some geometric improvements to help slow traffic. Um, David, I'm I'm not sure if you have anything to to add to that effect with some conversations with DPW as well. We, <clears throat> David Loring from Power Corporation as well. Um, we had talked. A little bit with DVW, but the traffic calming concerns were more to the yeah to the east with the horizontal and vertical site distance restrictions that we just spoke of. As you approach putting in the roundabout there, that would tend to slow traffic as they approach the school zone and that turning movement. So 
the, the roundabout becomes really a traffic calming element in and of itself. Um, heading westerly, coming out of the roundabout as you approach Pleasant Street, that's such a fairly short distance. We didn't really have the speed concerns, especially with a roundabout in place, interrupt that speed along Strong Street as they head westbound. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I have a couple of questions of um, other kinds of, this is from not knowing much about this, um, but if you didn't have a roundabout, but you had uh, speed bumps, um, you know, I, I'm seeing down by UMass, the speed bumps they have as you circle around them, they slow you down a lot. You, you, you're warned that a speed bump is coming and you, and you uh, go too fast over it at your peril. So that's a question because the roundabout is both expensive and it looks like it's a little tricky. And uh, you know, I wanna make sure Rupert speaks up about sight lines on this. So, so that's a question. And, and I don't know what staff currently does. Can we stop traffic? Can there be Something just, just, it seems to be mainly when um, people are leaving at the end of the day. So just trying to think of, uh, there's the flow off issue as well. And then over on the East Pleasant and Strong intersection, if there were a light there, could the light be set up so it's only working when it's time for school to be, you know, school morning hours, school evening hours, you know, so that the rest of the time it's a blinking orange? Because that, the, the thing about that street that I've observed is you're going down, if you're going downtown, you're coming down a slight hill, you're going toward a traffic circle, but people ignore the speed limit on that road completely. Um, and they come into the traffic circle too fast, even though, it, you know, and if we, if the town changed the speed limit, for example, way up further north to 25 miles an hour um, rather than its current speed limit and just slowed the traffic down. So I'm, and I, again, I'm looking at with, with more flow added at that, some, are there other things that aren't as expensive as a roundabout or a, a major signalization? Thanks, Kathy. Um, so to address the, the first item you had about um, traffic calming and what you've seen at UMass with the, uh, the race speed tables. Um, so when we look at traffic calming along an area, we have a number of different tools at our disposal. And each of those tools has um, a different impact on speed, but it also has a, uh, an impact on uh, other items as well. So we really, we really try to use the use a tool that's going to satisfy the needs of a particular area to the best of our ability. So a raised speed table um, is at the higher end of um, a, our toolkit as it relates to reducing speeds. So it's very effective at reducing speeds. Um, Generally, placing a speed table on a roadway like Strong Street could come could result in some other uh, impacts that would have to be assessed as well. Speed tables can impact drainage patterns. Um, they can also impact emergency vehicles. So we want to be careful when we're selecting our traffic calming measure that we are not uh, creating a situation where it's causing hazards in other ways. Okay. Yeah, I, I would clarify just to the difference between a speed bump and a speed table because people often get confused with the two. Um, a speed table generally allows traffic flow perhaps up to 20 miles an hour. Um, they tend to be a wide flat surface with gentle approach slopes on each side, whereas the speed bumps are what you commonly see more associated with a commercial type parking lot that are rough, abrupt vertical changes along the vehicle path. So the speed tables perhaps could be another tool to be complemented with a roundabout so that it improves pedestrian passage as well as slowing the vehicles down. Thank you, because I think the UMass ones, their tables, that, what you just described is what they are. They're, they're rises. They're not a, you know, jarring clump as you, and I think the snow plows get over them really easily. Um, hmm. so. 
Uh, yeah, South Hadley, Hadley by South Hadley by Elms College is a, an example of a speed table. I see Rupert, Sean, and Tammy. Thank you. Um, yeah, just two points. Uh, one is um, I have the impression that the uh, a rotary up at the driveway entrance actually does improve uh, our um, uh, our exit times from the school. It just doesn't affect the exit times from Strong Street onto East Pleasant. Is that correct? So the 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 roundabout at the driveway it it would improve um delay exiting the school but it would also increase delay along strong street um so when you're looking at the the intersection overall um that's where you don't necessarily see the improvement in level of service if you will it does help the driveway but at the cost of some delay on strong street and that the roundabout at the driveway would would not have any um uh, impact on the um uh, the pleasant street strong intersection. John? Yeah, you may have said this already. Is there um, like a typical score for a school? I know the goal is probably to get A's across the board, but um, I guess, what do you see at most schools and what is sort of, um, you know, if we can't achieve A's at either of these sites, is there, uh, you know, a typical target that most schools try to achieve? Yeah, Sean, that's a that's a good question. And um, there's it generally no, there's not a there's not a rating or a level of service that we're necessarily trying to achieve. Um, and quite frankly, A's across the board. Um, generally, it, de it, it depends on the intersection, the amount of traffic that the intersection is is handling, um, you know, at an intersection where you're really handling a lot of traffic volumes to get a level of service A, you really have to over construct a location. Um, it'd come at a great expense, um, that type of thing. Um, so to answer your question, it, it kind of depends. Um, okay. And it's it can be relative to, um, you know, a uh, when we're interpreting level of service, you know, a, a very urban area, we might interpret different than a more rural area. Um, again, it has to do with the amount of traffic volumes that an area is seeing in general. Okay. So, you know, what you might see in, um, you know, downtown Springfield might be different from what you and the way you interpret it in, in Amherst. Okay, thank you. Tammy. Uh, this isn't um, sort of a digression, it certainly isn't, and I'm a neophyte to this particular area for sure. Um, and while I completely understand the traffic study deals with uh, motor vehicles, because that's sort of like the, the greatest uh, amount of traffic, I am concerned about, and I don't know if there's any thought to uh, pedestrian traffic and students that ride bikes. We do have a, a percentage of students that will walk and ride bikes, and I don't know if there's a grading system for that, because I do think that that should be made really clear for both sites um, around that, and I don't know if that's something that is addressed in this. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and um, this was something that was brought up in last night's discussion um, as well, and the the, the traffic study, um, given the the scope of the area that we were, were looking at, um, and you know, given that the majority of, of students at both of these schools are, are driven to school, whether that be by parents or by buses, um, that was the, the, the primary focus of our study. I think when we look at pedestrian and bicycle connectivity, um, it's at a little bit of a smaller scale, seeing that it's, you know, not trips that are happening across town. It's more localized to the areas right around the school. So as we look at the, the adequacy and improvement of pet and bike facilities, it's, it's at a smaller scale, more targeted towards the site in the area immediately surrounding the site. So for instance, at, at you know, at Wildwood, um, if the improvements with the, the roundabout were to be uh, implemented at that driveway, providing adequate um, bike and pet connections as part of that improvement would certainly be something that is implemented.
I'm just looking to see if there are any other hands up. You know, what might be helpful, um, Donna, not, not immediately is that, you know, a sense of, I, I tried to walk around the Wildwood area and I did a little bit down at Fort River of a sense of where the walking paths are and where the sidewalks are, you know, different um, crosswalks, just, just a similar kind of, you know, if, if people were to walk, how can they walk and how can they bike? Because one of the interest Wildwood has got a lot of other kinds of pathways that aren't necessarily along the street that allow people to come in. And so does Fort River. It's got this back really long trail. I just have no idea how many people bike or walk it, but you didn't necessarily have to be on the street, but it, depending on where you're coming from, you might have to be on the street to cross an intersection. So yeah, that I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think it was Mike uh, Morris who talked about how the students actually do walk to the school. And I don't want to paraphrase Mike, but maybe you could give your personal opinion. Sure. Yeah, I'll just be brief that at Wildwood, there's a number of um, different residential. I don't know if you can bring back the map of Wildwood. It might be helpful to talk through with the map up there. Um, but if not, I, I can try to do it. Um, there's a number of residential neighborhoods that are sort of behind Wildwood. Um, and so historically, um, there's been a significant number of walkers uh, from, you know, you're not going to be able to see it. Um, there we go. So there's Wildwood. Um, so if you look at where Hills Road is sort of in white, so the neighborhoods behind Wildwood, um, uh, there's a number of, uh, there's a long history of students walking there. The other neighborhoods are sort of uh, near the regional middle school. So every morning uh, you'll see students walking through the middle school complex past the tennis courts up to get to Wildwood um, because it, it's there. there's a number of residential neighborhoods that are in there. So it, it sort of does come from all sides but primarily the streets behind Wildwood uh, and then further out from the middle school walking through. So those are the typical paths that we see students on. If you, if you drive by in the morning, you'll see students on the sidewalk up Strong Street, um, pretty decent hill, but good exercise for folks in the morning uh, to get there. And you'll often see uh, a number of students and families coming. When we had more extensive uh, Safe Routes to Schools programs, which we're trying to resurrect, uh, we tried to think about where students were coming from multiple angles. Uh, we historically have had an event where folks got together in the north, you know, yeah, I think the north end of downtown. Uh, and uh, had a, a group walk to school uh, day with families and students, and it was a huge success. And we had many, many uh, participants in that. So I think it's, it's, as a site, it's very prime for walkability uh, because of the number of residential residences that are in walking distance to school. And, you know, I think to be clear from a traffic perspective, they don't all come from one, one, one angle or, or one direction it really uh, because it's sort of surrounded by residential streets not I don't hear as much coming from the other side of strong street uh, to the north I mean I think there are some but uh, less so but but certainly on the other side of strong street coming from multiple angles and directions oh, Rupert's hand is up and Alicia so Rupert first thank you I just uh, wanted to point out from a, a school bus transportation perspective uh, normally we look at what the walk zone is for any school building uh, so that we uh, don't necessarily have to provide transportation if you're in the walk zone um, and the safety of the intersections that students have to cross uh, can conflict with uh, that walk zone forcing uh, you know a heavier transportation load for the school buses uh, particularly for example crossing route 9 is is problematic so those folks might be close enough to walk to school, but because of the dangers in the intersection, uh, it has an impact on transportation. Alicia. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out similarly to, to what um, Mike was talking about with Wildwood, that there are also a lot of um, families within walking distance from Fort River. Um, and I think that that will also to keep in mind that they're building the new affordable housing 
complex right across the street from Fort River right now. And there's also Colonial Village and Watson Farms and a lot of um, apartment buildings where families live very close in walking distance to Fort River as well. So any other questions on traffic study? And this study, when we, when we posted it and said, posted it and sent it out, um, there was a note on it that it's a draft. Um, and in it's draft in, in some of the, the wording, but also this possible mitigation is being worked through. Um, uh, I, uh, even the widening of the street as at the, leave, when you leave Fort River is a question of can, can you do it or not to get a second lane in. So some of these are, potentials rather than um, we've come up with. So I know Donna Donna was sort of reluctant at one point to post it because it was still a draft in progress. But so I think that we'll see it more polished up, but we may not have answers to some of these. Um, you know, Guilford, Guilford has noted, we've got an intersection up here. Amherst has a bunch of intersections that are Fs or Ds with or without a school. So um, it, and it's where the roads come together uh, were horse paths at one point and not really very good for where cars are coming together. So, so I, is, if there are no other questions on this, I think we'll move to the next part. Donna? Yeah, sure, maybe we should all go back to horses, huh? <laughs> <laughs> or bikes. Um, so, you know, I, we, in, in recent conversations, just talking about the two options or the three options, renovation addition, new school, is it going to be a two-story or a three-story school? So in a way, we're sort of looking at this as um, possibly kind of three concepts, so to speak. Um, we just wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about it. We thought instead of going through all the options that this would just be an easier way to kind of look at the options, the impacts that a, the layout of the school would have on the sites so that it's, it's a little easier to see kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, as it relates to community outreach and staff outreach, we had another meeting with staff yesterday to get their input, not so much where it sits on the site or the impacts the building has or which site, although folks um, opined on that, uh, was more so from an educational perspective, which layout works best uh, from an educational student-centered um, design. And I think there were mics on the call, Margaret. I Kathy, I don't remember honestly, Kathy. I'm sorry, you weren't. I don't think you were. I wasn't. There. Yeah, um, Allison was there. So I think there were like 24 or 34 folks that were on the call. Some of that was us, but um, we had questions. People asked questions, which was very helpful. Trying to understand the layouts a little more. Um, two folks did state that they preferred a, a three-story option. It's kind of option one here. Um, they did prefer that. Actually, this is weird because I updated this. But anyway, concept one um, was preferred. Two people said that, and no one else really gave an opinion one way or another for any of the concepts. Um, so. Mike, I don't know if you want to talk through what we want to, what our ideas to move forward. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just share my opinion. You know, I think Donna's right. We had, we had a lot of staff on the call. We, I think Donna did a really, in my opinion, nice job and her team of explaining what the um, advantages, disadvantages of um, sites. Um, we're going to gather more feedback. We're going to share the video of the presentation. The slides are both. Um, to gather more feedback from staff. But, um, you know, for me, having kind of, there's multiple factors that weigh in on this. 
Uh, one is that, you know, from our designers and, and experts, uh, that there's a cost savings to go into three stories and a positive environmental impact of that. Um, so those th two things matter to me because money we're spending one place means we're not spending it somewhere else, right? There's uh, and so an environmental impact obviously is important to me. I'm not on the net zero committee, but, but I understand that this promotes, um, promotes those goals. You can do net zero either way, but, um, you know, I take the, those words seriously that I hear from people more knowledgeable than me in that regard. Uh, from an educational point of view, we did meet with the specialized program staff, which I think is worth noting down it as well, that, um, that work in, in our three specialized programs, looked at different models. And then Allison, uh, Tammy, myself, and Joanne Smith, one of our special ed administrators, went to a school in Springfield that was three stories. And what I shared yesterday and I'll share today is um, I really liked having two grade levels per floor. That made sense to me. It was incredibly quiet in the hallways. A school built for 400 that had 480 students in it. Uh, and it was much quieter than any of our one single story hallways are over the course of the day, um, just because of the nature of how things um, have, you know, go vertically, they're spending less time walking through hallways, more time learning, which is, you know, right, I'm an educator, that's my goal, uh, is around student learning. So, um, you know, and I think fitting on the site, whatever site it is, it, you know, the smaller footprint makes a difference. Uh, and, uh, you know, more green space, uh, whether it's Fort River or Wildwood, to me is a positive. So I'm in favor of a three-story building. Uh, I think we didn't hear conflicting data yesterday. We certainly didn't hear from everyone on the call, but uh, Donna was pretty explicit at asking for feedback multiple times uh, throughout the meeting. And some people did weigh in on that, some people didn't. Um, but you know, in terms of my comfort level and seeing the advantages and disadvantages, um, I see it more advantages and disadvantages when I look at three-story versus two-story. So you know, that's, I, I think the last thing I'll say is I like the adjacencies a bit better. Uh, so when you look at two story, you're looking at long corridors longer than our current long corridors um, and where things are located feels less consistent. Yeah, if you could bring up some of the slides that look internally. Um, so in terms of integration of special ed and ELL on a three story building, you've got two grade levels and uh, things weave together really quickly where students aren't walking far to get from a gen ed classroom to getting support if, if that's what they, they need. Uh, and when we looked at the two story, it just there was long corridors, three good levels, and, and it looked uh, less integrated, uh, in my opinion. So again, that's for the committee to consider, but that'd be you know where I'm sitting on the issue at the moment. Uh, I see Alicia's hand is up. I'm just wondering if Allison or Tammy want to um, also, to the extent you were at the meetings, give any impression. I mean, you don't have to. It's completely up to you. I'm happy to say something, but I certainly don't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, I think from my years of teaching, plus being a special education teacher, uh, from the educational and an educational standpoint, as well as an equitable uh, standpoint, uh, I, I did find that the three-story building that we visited uh, would give a higher impact for learning um, versus the amount of time that being in what looks like to me being in a two-story building with a longer footprint um, would also decrease those opportunities for learning and maximizing uh, what I would hope to be uh, a more just sort of education because by being in a, a smaller uh, in a building that has a smaller footprint where we only have two grades per potentially uh, per floor, um, it maximizes teacher opportunity to collaborate and uh, allows for flexibility. Thank you. I, yeah, uh, I think the only other thing just to quickly add to that is the goal of having the integrated special ed programs. And when you have um, these kind of pods of grades per wing, so to speak. It just creates a um, difficult, a, a little bit more of a challenge for the integration of, of these special ed programs, especially when there may be more than one grade attending one of these programs. So it's an un unintended consequence of creating these um, kind of 
grade level pods. Alicia. Oh. I'm wondering if we know um, how many educators from Wildwood and Fort River attended the forum last night. I don't know I'm, about last night. I mean, I think the, uh, I don't know if Donna has that, but the afternoon forum, I think you gave the number um, that was had and it was requested that we did, um, it was a meeting on the clock. So it started at 2.45. So it was during teachers paid work day and it was an optional meeting. We didn't force anybody to go who didn't wanna go. Um, but I think that, no, oh, Allison has her hand up, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanna say um, it was an optional meeting, but we canceled all other meetings so that people could attend. I wanna make that sure. And then we made announcements and sent several emails so that, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that people felt like they could go. And I did see an, a number of Wildwood educators there. Um, the majority were definitely from Wildwood. I don't, I, I don't remember seeing other educators from other schools. I do wanna say, um, uh, when we're talking about bringing 575 students together, um, I think it is a good thing to mention, like we don't want like Crocker Farm being seen as the cozy, you know, this is your school that you get with you want a nice neighborhood feel. And then you have the Amherst Elementary, which is gonna feel big and unwieldy. I think that the smaller footprint letting, um, allowing for two grades per floor, it felt very cozy to me. And I say that in the best way, it didn't, it didn't feel um, like it was too small at all. But I think when you think of bringing a larger number of students together, how do we help there feel like a sense of community? And it felt that way to me. It felt like this would be a way to say, no, no, you're not losing anything by going to the school with more students. Alicia. Thank you, sorry. Um, and I was just wanting clarity. I, I did want to know how many um, teachers attended, if that's possible, the session. And sorry, I was um, not clear about which session I was asking about, but the information session for the educators. Yeah, that, that, so there were, there were actually two yesterday, Alicia. There was one in the afternoon that focused on uh, layouts, adjacencies, and programs and two-story, three-story. That was the entire focus of it. And last night's community forum spent a pretty short amount of time on that. And it was more showing how these layouts would work on each of the sites. So there was, uh, we will we'll be posting that. That will be available as YouTube, but there was a, a lot of community interest on the sites themselves, you know, the geotechnical, um, questions on bikers and pedestrians. So that the focus last night, we have a, it's possible to get a list of everyone that's there, but I can imagine that busy teachers didn't spend their afternoon staring at layouts and then come and do another three hours at night. Um, but that, that presentation and discussion will be available to all staff. So the nice thing about it is we don't have to choose now. Um, and we're going to get estimates on the two-story versus three-story along with the site. So it's not a forced choice at this point um, between anything. We'll, we'll have more information. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, I was able yeah. to attend the, the forum last night. And thank you. I, it, was, it was a great presentation. Um, but my question was how many educators from Wildwood and Fort River attended the session? And I meant the, uh, the teachers, the session that was for the educators. Like what was the attendance level? Cause I'm looking for like, a, I'm wondering in terms of outreach. So I'm wondering how many educators we got feedback from in terms of Wildwood versus Fort River. So I have, um, Alicia, I have the, a screenshot of, of everyone. I'm counting, I think there were 18 folks. Um, I have names of everyone except for an iPhone. So <laughs> I can give these to um, Mike and Tammy and, and uh, Allison and they can maybe decipher who was on the call. Um, but, you know, this was 
announced, we sent a flyer, as Allison said, um, multiple kind of uh, reminders to folks that uh, this, this was occurring and we really are looking for feedback to take it a step further if folks, you know, some folks are comfortable speaking up and, and other folks are uncomfortable, you know, voicing their opinion in large groups, whether it's Zoom and we can't, can or can't even see their faces. So we recorded it and we're going to issue it and we're going to develop a questionnaire to hopefully elicit um, some feedback that is not leading, but will hopefully generate what people's comments are the pros and cons from their perspective for each of the options. And, and Donna, this was not the first time you've met with the teachers either. You know, I mean, I know there were- This, is the, this is the third time we've met yeah. with the teachers. Yeah. That, well, that we've, we've had these meetings, whether, right. whether people attended or not, yeah. yeah. So I know, you know, I, I got, uh, Allison had written me because I, the way I'd listed the agenda, I'd listed as possible decision um, on two story versus three story. And I only put that in because on an agenda, should we have wanted to make a decision, I would have had to signal it. So we, we don't have to make a decision right now. And I think Donna, you said last night that you're planning on getting estimates for both a two story and a three story option. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we will we'll have well, both options costed. Alicia, is your hand up? I didn't know whether your hand went up again, so. Yeah, I just wanted to explain why, why I was wondering um, why I'm asking this question. Um, and it's, again, in terms of outreach. And so I'm trying to figure out like how many people we are reaching um, because I also didn't notice while the forum I thought was really great last night and I did get a lot of community feedback and there's a lot of information from you all. It is the same attendees who attended the last forum, in, in my opinion. And so what I'm looking for and hoping is like, how many people are we reaching out to? Um, and how many different educators are we reaching out to rather than continuously hearing from the same number of educators? Because I want to hear, I mean, I think it's really important to get feedback from the community, from the youth, um, but also from the educators. Um, different educators. And so I want to know how we're measuring and keeping track of that. Um, and I think it's great that we sent out multiple means of communication, letting people know about the forum, but then um, in terms of how many people attended or were able to attend, which is still slightly unclear to me, I'm wondering if we're offering any other forms or ways that they can provide us feedback and how we're measuring that as well. Mike. Sure. So um, I think uh, I'm not going to repeat what Allison, you know, shared, but we uh, created space on people's paid schedule where they, this was an option for them to attend. Um, I think as Donna was indicating before, uh, we're going to send out electronic version and ask for written feedback from folks who didn't didn't arrive. And if there's other kind of avenues or ways or ideas, um, please just pass them my way. We're happy to uh, try to do whatever we can do. Um, but, you know, I think the reason we put it on during paid time and Allison, thank you for canceling meetings in the afternoon, because I know that had an impact on your school because there were other meetings that you had, um, you know, but, you know, we're not inclined to force people to go uh, to meetings uh, asking for engagement, uh, but we tried to create the conditions by which people uh, would be on the clock and paid for their time to attend the meeting. Thank you. So I, I think we'll move, um, keep going. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so we can, we only have a couple more items on today's agenda. And I did want to talk about the meeting schedule a little bit um, since we have posted. So maybe I'll do that first. I had a I have a question um, on whether we need to have this, uh, is it posted? Oh, Donna didn't even list it on this one. Okay. Um, we, we listed on our, as a possible meeting next Friday, 
for just a one hour meeting that would be to discuss options with no presentation whatsoever, but just to go around the room. And my understanding from Denisco is today with the traffic study, this is the last time we would get a major presentation. So it, we will have time on uh, May 20th to start to have that go around the room and be discussing what we've heard. So, and we will, they will be sending the cost estimating information specifications, as Margaret said, to the estimators. We will get that before we meet on the 20th. And to the extent we have any, we'd like, what's this? What have you asked for? We can discuss that. So I'm, I'm proposing we don't meet <laughs> on the 13th, which would be next Friday for an hour. And instead we make sure we carve out the space on the 20th to have it just be a group discussion, you know, focus first on what we, we won't have the cost estimates yet. And then on June 3rd, we will have the cost estimates. So on the 20th, we can start to say with this uh, matrix, and this is a lead in to saying we have a criteria matrix, we can start to say, what do we think about these options? You know, what do, without making a decision, what do we think about Fort River versus Wildwood? What do we think about building new versus ad reno before we get cost? So I'd like to hear, I had, I think it was my proposal to do the 13th at this one hour. So if people are comfortable just going from now and then having carving out that time the 20th, I think we would just eliminate the 13th. So I wanted to find out if that seems like a good idea to everybody. And I guess if anyone really wants to, yes, Mike, <laughs> if I could say yeah. anyone who wants to keep the 13th should tell me. But, we'll yeah. rarely uh, advocate against canceling a meeting. So I mean, <laughs> it's a good reason to meet. I'm, I'm open to it, but uh, I think you'll be a popular chair. That's my guess. Okay, so there won't be a meeting on the 13th. And then um, the cost estimate specifications will be sent, but we will get them hopefully the Monday or Tuesday before we meet on the 20th in terms of what was sent and to the extent we have any comments on them it's still time to do that and then we'll be, we'll be focusing on this criteria matrix um so that's just a, a a piece and donna i don't know whether our two people who did the traffic study it's been great that they join us but if you want to continue with us it's fine but you you yeah you, thank you you, you guys, <laughs> oh, would like. <laughs> we yeah, would not think you. it. You know, so we could continue to have we could have a more focused discussion, and the matrix we're working with has. Thank you very much, by the way, D David and Tim. Thank <laughs> you. Thank, thank you. you. Both for Talk last to night and tonight, you were very clear. So thank you. Thank very you, much. Kathy. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. So Kathy, the only thing I wanted to on the schedule, I think we talked about moving the June 17th meeting oh, right. and I'm, I'm scurrying quickly through my calendar trying to figure out what date we landed on because I know it's so, last day of school. So Mike, Mike, alert, Mike and Tammy and Allison alerted me that that's the last day of school. So that's not a good date, the 17th. And Mike, said looking at his calendar, the two possible alternatives were Monday of that week. Um, and I got to get my calendar out. Yeah, that's what I have, the 13th as a tentative hold. So, so, so Monday the 13th would be a possible alternative. And then if the 13th in the morning, we're talking about uh, Monday morning, if the 13th didn't work, it was the 10th of June, which would be right after the June 9th community forum. And so, so I didn't know, I mean, I could send out a poll to see whether people prefer the 13th or the 10th, but maybe right now, if the 13th, which is a Monday work for people, um, maybe people could indicate whether it doesn't work. Um, or I don't know which is the best way to get this. I hate to do a, a, a poll of 12 people or 11 people in real time, but those are our two alternative dates that work. Mike, I'm correct that that worked on your schedule, correct? Yeah. 
So we wanted to make sure because that's when, that's just before the, we need to move from many choices to one. So um, that's an important, uh, that, that's a really important meeting to make sure that everyone can come to it. Can anyone not make the 13th? Uh, and Angelica. But I think you said, is the 13th out, but the 10th works for you, Angelica? No, as I mentioned, Kathy, I, I will be out of the country and doing field work. So I will not be within uh, Wi-Fi range for, to, for between June 1st and June the 17th or 18th. So, so neither, none of the dates would work. Um, and Angelica had asked Paul, and I'll just find out if she can't participate in the meeting, can she, and we're taking a vote, if we, if we are trying to get to a preferred option by that point, can you vote without being in the meeting? And I, I, I don't know you what, to, and I think, you, the is, I think the answer is no, so. You, you have to be present to vote, yes. So it would be important Angelica, then on the 20th, when we're all talking with each other to come with as much as you can on a, your thoughts about the sites and about the choices we have of building new or ad reno, because it looks like you won't be there for that decision. Anyone else? So it does the 13th work for everyone else? Yes, so we're gonna, officially say it's June 13th instead of June 17th. And it will be scheduled for 8.30 in the morning. Okay, so with that said, said um, I'm just, I wanna make sure a couple of people said they have a hard stop at 10.30. So maybe Margaret, um, we, we need to do an invoice today. Maybe you could just bring up the matrix and we, we can defer a, an extended discussion on it, but we uh, had a, after we had a focused discussion on it, I did a possible shorter version that I sent out to everyone. And Margaret, if you can do it in a way that we, well, let's just do the, what has been added to this. Dinesco did give us some information and it was stated last night. And I think I emailed it to everyone on the question of how much acreage is on the site, how much is buildable versus usable. And there's an extensive set of words that go with each of those that I didn't put it in, but this is looking at the um, wetlands, the flood prone conservancy where we need to be careful of those demarcations in terms of building. It gets us into a permitting situation, um, but it gives you a sense that one site clearly has more space on it and a lot more field space. We, there's no question that we can use that space for fields. So that's been added to this matrix and there was discussion, I don't think we need to make it today on whether we stay with a four point scale or a three point scale where some of these, I think we have eliminated the one thing that was completely unacceptable, and that was the 165 person school, um, where we aren't looking at that anymore. So I'm not sure that any of our options are unacceptable. <laughs> there are some that are less good, and some are more good, which is horrible English. <laughs> um, so we could go to a three point scale, or we could keep for. Um, I don't have a strong feeling about it. Um, there was some feeling expressed that people didn't like neutrals, this, this pinky shade, you know, that it's either good or it's not good. Um, but that we could discuss at a later point. And I just didn't know, we'll post this again. If this is our matrix, um, then this what is what market is you scroll down. We left a few issues remaining, but we put some things up. Every school will meet next net zero. Every school will have safety. Every school will have certain things, so we don't need to rate them on it. Um, redistricting impacts, having gone to the consolidated school, it's not clear that any site has a different impact on districting, you know, any of our choices. So this is one we could delete. That was an, a potential delete. 
So I, uh, I'm gonna look for the com committee to give me input on this. This was my attempt to get to a smaller number of criteria. Um, this, uh, I had forgotten one and a public comment alerted me to this that provide flexibility for future enrollment growth. Right now, it used to be up in education. It got moved to building. It could be on site, just on a room for growth, which is different than flexibility of education, the way the layouts are. And we added one during the discussion that if we needed to get any permission from the middle school, if we were talking about that field at all, uh, we would have to. And that's just purely would we do it or not. Removed from this is two story versus three story. There is a matrix for that. And removed from this is a decision on which HVAC system we go with. And my understanding is Danesco is planning to do cost estimates that for now assume ground source because that's the most expensive option. So we could still come back and do the less expensive. And is that correct? We're not having to make that decision, Donna? Um, yep. At, yep. At this point. Yep. yep, that's correct. But we're also going to have um, an alternate, so to speak, with the air source and the cost estimates. So, so we don't have to, the basic thing is we don't have to make a decision to. now oh. as part of this getting down. The, the key decision is which site and, and which building. So, right. but, this, but Kathy, this, just, just to add, I'm sorry. Um, sure. it, when we move into uh, schematic design, we will need to know at, at you know, um, like as soon as possible because the ground source clearly impacts the site. Air source is easy, right? But the ground source has all kinds of site implications. So what I think what you're warning us is that we have the last meeting scheduled right now for June 27th, but there will be one in July. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, like if, if we if 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 we if could decide on coordinating, that would be preferred because um, and you you would probably MSBA as part of the preferred schematic report. We're going to, you know, if we haven't selected, you're going selected a, a ground source or air source, you know, we have to show MSBA that maybe we carry the higher number with the possible possibility that that um, air source may be a consideration because they want to know cost, right? So um, maybe we have two tables. I don't know. I got to think this through a little bit more, but. Um, we definitely would need to know like immediately after the vote, which is the preferred. So if we could come to that conclusion as part of this, and we're working, you know, with the net zero and we've been, I think we have their preferred, but we, we need to circle back on that one more time as well. That would be helpful. Because net, the net zero subcommittee did not reach a conclusion, Donna. We, 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 uh, we, we had it as a maybe, but so if, yeah. if, we, if we need to meet again, we'll figure out how to do that. Right. So on this matrix, you know, I can repost it. I, I posted it for the last meeting. And the main thing that's been added here was this flexible building. And now that we have the acreage piece, but I would propose that this is the working document that when we come together on May 20th, we start to say, okay, uh, as I look across the row, this is a green, you know, or this is a pink, you know, or whatever, that we start to fill it out a little bit where we won't have the cost yet. We just, and we don't have to fill it out completely. So I'm looking for any kind of feedback on that rather than, and then, and then sending this out to everyone. And I'm really serious that this is, this is our criteria matrix. So if something is missing or you think there are too many rows. And the final thing is, um, Jonathan in particular spoke to this, but as did Mike, of uh, thinking are, there are a few of these criteria that are the most important, <laughs> you know, that, that we, we weigh them more, we, we put higher value, you know, and one would be fit with the education program, cost is clearly going to be one of them. So I will stop talking and call on Mike. I wonder, um, if, if the chair is agreeable, I would just move that we accept this matrix 
uh, as what we plan to use moving forward. And then if there's a second, if not, not, but if there is, then we can have discussion. But, you know, I think everyone's done a great job with it. And I think we're at the point where I feel like we need to affirmatively move forward with it. So uh, I move that we accept this matrix um, as presented. Now, Jonathan, I guess, is there a second? Yeah. I, I, I'm almost ready to second, I guess I'd say, is you had an item down under building, the first item under building, uh, contextual design. I actually would uh, encourage us to eliminate that. All, all, I'm sure all the designs can be made contextual. It's a very subjective um, uh, thing to assess. And I would say not really a practical thing to assess without uh, 3D expressions of the building. So to, to me, that's, you know, that's something that could be eliminated. And, and, and at that point, I would be willing to say, here we go, this is our, our proposal or our matrix. Kathy, can I do a point of order? Sure. I, uh, not to be, and I could be wrong in this, but I don't think we should be discussing it until it's either seconded and open for discussion or not. I will second your motion. There we go. Yeah, and it wasn't okay. to disagree with Jonathan's point. Okay, point. okay. So, so the motion the motion has been made and seconded by by Shane and Jonathan has proposed an amendment, a uh, uh, deletion of contextually sensitive design. And this was one that was raised, Jonathan, when we talked as why do we need this? Um, so Donna, do you want to speak to Mike's yeah. uh, to Jonathan's? Well, Jonathan's comment, I guess, as, as it relates to a sense of contextually sensitive design. So, someone at the community meeting last night also said, are we going to be seeing, you know, three dimensional models or anything? Um, I'm not sure if he was asking as it related to cost estimates or what, but um, at this phase, we really haven't had the opportunity to start showing you um, visually contextually the materials and how it would fit on each site. So that really, we're, we're in agreement that um, it's premature in the process to be evaluating the quote unquote design of the building, which will come at the next phase. So uh, hearing no objections, I think we remove that row. Um, Paul? Yeah, I think Mike has to accept that we remove the make that part of the motion so we don't have to vote on the amendment. Okay, Mike, do you accept that amendment? It is a very friendly amendment. I accept it. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> As people may have observed, I, I need my parliamentarians along the way <laughs> to tell me what to do next. Any, any other comments, including um, you know, if we accept this matrix and then we start to work with it, we can, I think, as a committee, decide one road just doesn't work and we can delete it later if we want to. The Rupert. Uh, just a question. Uh, does accepting this matrix uh, still allow us a future discussion about how to weight the various components? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Angelica? I had a similar question and also how we could indicate on that matrix about which um, the weight values. So it, would there be like, um, you know, an, an index where you'd see the weight values and how much that. And then my, my um, other question is also if we're making revisions on this and suggesting things to be deleted, is there like a process of guidelines so that we do this in a like um, a kind of similar way that we all follow the same process or procedure? Okay, so a, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, you know, and, and Angelica, I know you work with weighted survey data as, as I have. It's, it's very tricky to assign values to lines. So we could either assign values um, or we could say uh, rows, a certain number of rows are the most important to us as we're looking through it. So then we, as our eyes go down, the idea of the color coding was you could see something gets a lot of green or something gets a lot of red, or I think on some of these, we're gonna find that they're on the one hand, on the other hand, it's not a clear plus or a minus. Um, so, so even assigning points to it. So I think any suggestions would be useful. And the process of adding or subtracting, 
I guess in my um, sort of practical sense is if we start to try to populate these, we might find one of these just doesn't work. Or when I go down, Margaret, if you scroll down a little bit to the, the, the traffic in, traffic out, cars, pedestrian, there's, there's a series of rows that has to do with this, the site. It, it may be they all cluster together you know that that you, that we're saying you know this this place works better for all of those so it may be that th there's some redundancy in these um and we just left them because they're separate concepts so i think if you send in if you send to me as chair any thoughts on this i'll send this out right after the meeting on this we could probably quickly make this a more efficient matrix if we wanted to, to get to a smaller number of criteria. And I sent out a memo, uh, it was in last meet, with my initial thoughts of possible high priority, and that was put out there to stimulate conversation rather than I've thought long and hard and these are this is it. <laughs> it was more to provoke. So what I'd propose if people are willing to move on this motion that this is the matrix we're going to go into the 20th with, what I would propose is I resend it to everyone with this one deleted. Um, and then people think about which are their highest priority rows, if there are any, and if they have any waiting, waiting ideas, and if anything potentially could be eliminated right as we're going in. And I will just do a summary memo of every comment I get, you know, with just these are the comments I got. Does does that work as a process, Angelica? Sure, I think that that works. And um, I was also going to suggest if it's possible to receive this as a Google Doc or something so that we can make some edits to it that, you know, maybe we could send back to you and that way it's not completely erased those edits. Maybe that would help. I think we can send a Google Docs as long as it's not sequential. The, the issue we ran into with the council is that we're not supposed to deliberate as a quorum when we're not in a meeting. And so it's a fantastic device for collecting everybody's comments. And so we ended with the council with a much more awkward way of, of one person collected them all um, and then put the, and then added them. So just what you're suggesting. So um, I'll send it out as an Excel matrix with a comment column on it. And so if people individually send that back to me, then I can assemble it. it it's Paul is nodding his head, but it was something we, we decided we just couldn't use um, to collect people's opinions. Um, because we would be sharing our opinion outside of a meeting. Um, okay. Paul is nodding his head. I think I captured that correctly. Yeah. Okay. So let, let me just say there's been a motion has been seconded. I just want to know if there's any more discussion. The motion was with the friendly amendment to delete one row to make this our matrix. Um, are people ready to vote on that? And Margaret, did you want to speak to this first before we vote? I can wait. It's, 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 uh, I have a comment about the three versus four um, grade, but I, that's not what you're taking the motion on. So I can wait if that's helpful. Okay, so then I'm going to call a vote on this. Um, and I will call it by the people who are here. And I still think we, we still have a quorum. So, Paul. Yes. Uh, Mike. Yes. Ben. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Tammy. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Sean. Yes. And Kathy is a yes. It's unanimous with, um, I think we're now, uh, Alicia dropped off and Phoebe isn't here and Simone isn't here, Margaret. So we'll have to in the minute show that three were, that people were absent. So unanimous okay. with those who were present. Thank you. Thank you for the motion, Mike. Okay, comment, Margaret. So um, I, I want to put in a plug, I think I've said this before, for the three-point versus the four-point system. It's not my decision to make. I'm, 
Mike had commented when we discussed this previously that um, a, the sort of four level system is sort of a, I would call it a, a feature of um, studies. Um, I, for me, the three point system for the public is more helpful um, because I think it is more clear and straightforward but uh, that's just my opinion for your consideration. So I propose that we make that decision next time we meet because I'm also conscious of time. And so we will just get quickly to, is it three or four? Um, and people can kind of play with this when I send it back out to see whether you, you ever get to four in terms of trying to play with putting, putting colors to some of the boxes. Um, so we have one, Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. We have one other agenda item, which is the invoice. And I do want to take public comments as well. And I know Paul said he has a hard stop at 1030. So we need to be careful to keep a quorum. Um, so Margaret, we have the one invoice for Dinesco. Yes, uh, give me one second. I have a furry object that's in my way here. <laughs> And, and while she's doing it, Kathy, I think I uh, might need to make you the host. Um, so okay, because both you, both you and Sean are having to leave at ten thirty. Yes. So I know we, I know you have the public comment piece, so we have to have and a quorum. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, are we still seven if you two leave? I don't. I'm not sure we are. Two, one, two, three, four, five. Maybe Sean can go, and then I, we can do the whatever. Well, um, do we, I'm just torn because I would hate to not have public comments. You have to do public comment to regular so Yeah, we, we can hold the invoice. Okay, so it, let's it move. It came yesterday. Okay, so we're, we're moving directly to public comment um, okay. to make sure we have space for it and we have a quorum. So anyone who would like to make a public comment, please raise their hand. Uh, Sean, Sean or Paul, I see one hand. Yeah, I'm close bring, it in, uh, bring it in, Maria. Maria, I think you are, you've joined us if you want to mute. Yes. yes. So I have several comments to make about the, the traffic study, which as you know, was put up very late um, before this meeting. And uh, I don't know if anybody, I, I, it's incredibly frustrating that documents continue to be posted so late. In addition, the MSBA response, which was received prior to your last meeting, did not get posted until extremely late before this meeting, less than 24 hours. Um, I'll forward on those points about the traffic study, but I just have to, um, what just went on here with having a vote, which was incidentally not listed as specifically a vote in the agenda about a matrix where you just got another revision you haven't talked about the documents that were posted in previous uh, iterations and you just canceled a meeting for next week and are talking about making all kinds of revisions to this matrix that you just voted to approve is completely befuddling to me. Um, you need... <laughs> Th this the process on that is is not good and i think you need to revisit that and i think you need to reconsider having another meeting because you're trying to jam a lot of stuff in here and you've got several members not even present uh for this for this vote um that's it's not okay um yeah, the presentation 
by your geotechnical and civil engineers was once again very good. Um, I was confused why you didn't use their analysis and their what they told you about the floodplain at Fort River not being in that location and then proceeded to use bright blue in future slides, which are posted for the public to see um, for the other discussion of options. That's, that's also completely confusing and uh, irritating to me because we know that the firm maps are going to be voted on and that large blue area is not accurate. Um, that was extremely disappointing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I will send further comments to you by email. Thank you, Maria. I'm, do we have, uh, we have two more people with their hands up. Uh, Rudy's coming in now. Yeah, the end, um, did you call on me? Oh, yep, yeah, Rudy, you, you uh, joined the room. You're, you're the, here. The process, you always get kicked out of the, of the Zoom call when you, you get added as a panelist and you go mute. So anyway, a uh, quick question, Will. Um, will the potential offsite costs uh, it sounded like the offsite costs of both a roundabout at the driveway entrance and the extra lane uh, addition and the phase change of the signals for Fort River were going to be added as cost lines in the cost estimate coming up, if I got that right. Um, but it sounded, I see people shaking their heads, so I'm going to assume that. What about that piece of changes at Strong? and uh, East Pleasant Street, will those get captured as an, a line item? I understand the traffic engineers are still working on that. And I wondered if we'll get that cleared up enough in time for there to be uh, a line item on that. And I'd, I'd encourage you to try to get that in too, if that might be a part of the additional town costs uh, for that. And I've asked previously if there could be a way to break out the uh, field costs um, that were not comparative, comparable between the two schools um, and, and have those as a separate line. I guess that's getting dropped by the board, but I hope people will, will at least take that into account when they see the numbers for the site costs at Fort River that you're getting substantially different item for the site with uh, those costs if they're not broken out um, separate from the very small area of playing fields that you'll get with Wildwood. So thanks. Um, Sean, you're bringing in, we have one more person with their hand up. Tony, you've joined us if you unmute. I think you yeah, there you are. Hi, Tony. Hi, Hi. Tony Cunningham, Holland and Drive. Um, I was just wondering when you will be discussing the MSBA comments on the PDP and the draft uh, responses from the district. I quickly scanned it yesterday evening and it seemed that some of the comments from the MSBA would impact the floor plan and the space summary. Um, so I was wondering, I was a bit perturbed when you canceled that other meeting because I think there seems to be a lot that you need to talk about with respect to that. Um, and then I would request that the draft basis of design narrative be posted today, um, it, which would be a week before you send it to AM Fogarty, because I think there's um, a lot of interest in reviewing what's being sent, especially as it relates to the site, um, site work on site and both site work off site, um, and, and as it relates to what you discussed today with the traffic study. So if that uh, basis of design narrative could be posted publicly today, that would be appreciated. Thank you. So I think that is, that is it for hands up. Um, 
So just our, our process, um, a few of these questions are answerable and we may not may have not posted the answers yet. Um, uh, the field cost question was asked um, and Inesco has answered it. So I think what we'll do, Margaret and I were posting, trying to post some answers to questions on what will be it. And um, my understanding um, just with the schedule is the draft that will be sent to the estimator is not available yet, but we, we will double check to give provide some answers to this. So I think that is, it's 1027. Um, and Paul is doing a thumbs up that we're miraculously ending on time. Um, if um, I, as I, as people know, I was the one who asked for the separate meeting. If between after the 20th, we feel like we need another, we need more space, the committee's just got to ask for it and we will create the space. Um, we're not trying to rush a decision here. It's just, I'm also conscious that everybody is pressed for time. So coming prepared will, with questions, with uh, your thoughts at this point is extremely important. And um, I'm gonna send, we will send links right away to last night's community forum when they're available and the charts and the staff meeting. So to the extent you can get the word out that this is not this is not a done deal at this point, you know, in terms of we are moving toward making a decision and even the specific layouts, if we chose three story building, that's in motion, it's not a final decision there, that would be in schematic design, so that people understand what level of decision we're making. So I want to thank everyone. Um, thank everyone for coming. Great comments. And uh, the Donesco team, and I know, Mike, also, you worked amazingly long hours on the MSBA comments. And I will just say that another counselor who's at an MMA fiscal policy meeting heard a town say, what is MSBA doing these days? They're, uh, they've never seen anything like they just got back, um, you know, and they think MSBA is trying to spread limited money among more schools. And, but, but, but it was extremely time consuming. And just so people know, they asked us for documents that they had that we didn't because they forgot to send them to us. So, so it was just a very interesting process to get to respond to them. I, and uh, those comments, um, I really appreciate the amount of work that went into responding to that. So thank you very much. And we are adjourned at